leaders. Uh, it's truly a privilege to have both of you. It's 7.33 now. Uh, I would request we can begin the session now. Okay. Uh, so good evening, everyone, and maybe good morning from uh, uh, for some of us uh, who are joining from other parts, including our uh, uh, lead author for today's talk. So welcome for City Book Leaders. As you know, that it's an amazing platform to bring uh, uh, authors uh, who have written some amazing, interesting books. Uh, I'm your host today. My name is Dwarika Unyal. I'm a teacher and an occasional poet. Uh, so I would start this conversation because this conversation is all centered around a very interesting book called The Economics of Small Things. And we have amongst us uh, Professor Sudipta Sarangi, the author of this book, who is the uh, very senior economist from US. He's the head of department in the economics department in Virginia Tech. In US, he's got a very illustrious career, more than uh, three decades. Uh, he is an uh, alum of also the Delhi School of Economics, and of course, did his PhD from US, and he's been there for long. But the story would start about how I know uh, Sudipta. Uh, you know, so Bachpan se, uh, meri maa kaha karti thi, ki beta bahar jao, लेकिन अजनबियों से बातें मत करो तो मेरी माँ कहा करती थी कि अजनबियों से बातें नहीं करो एंड आई हैव ए थ्योरी दैट आवर कॉन्वर्सेशन बिकम वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग वेन वी आर इन द मोस्ट अमाउंट ऑफ डिस्कम्फर्ट सो एज द कम्फर्ट इंक्रीजेस कॉन्वर्सेशन गो डाउन सो नॉन ए सी में सेकेंड स्लीपर में या फिर बिना रिजर्वेशन में वी विल फर्स्ट फाइट बट वी विल हैव अमेजिंग कॉन्वर्सेशन विद स्ट्रेंजर्स एंड वील एंड अपमिंग वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग फ्रेंड्स ओवर पीरियड ऑफ टाइम बट एज द कम्फर्ट इंक्रीजेस फ्रॉम स्लीपर टू थर्ड ए सी टू सेकेंड ए सी टू फर्स्ट एंड इन फ्लाइट यू डोंट हैव कॉन्वर्सेशन एंड इन माई एक्सपीरियंस ऑफ टेकिंग सो मेनी थाउजेंड्स ऑफ फ्लाइट इन ऑल दीज इयर्स आई रियलाइज आई फाइंड द मोस्ट ग्रम्पियस्ट ऑफ द पीपल इन फ्लाइट्स so it was very interesting in a decade back almost in 2012 10 years back almost and in a flight to bhubaneswar from there and we started conversing and he loves talking and that's how we ended up knowing each other so for sarangi tell us what is so specific and interesting about economics of small things what is so intriguing about it you've been a big academic but how are you looking at these smaller interesting anecdotal things and finding a very interesting economic principle about it so just tell us about this whole idea of economics of small things thank you thank you dwari and thank you everyone thank you mohit uh, for having me so yes i will do that i made a few slides so if it's okay and and dwari i will answer exactly your question um so let me share my slides and then we can try to yeah. answer the question that you have posed okay so give me a second to make it full screen and yep okay so there we go normally when we talk about economics what you see is what's on the left hand side this is actually a shot from one of my own papers right so this is a paper which talks about you know suppose you have your social network which you inherit from your parents and then you form your professional network and we show that inequalities are perpetuated so people who are born with a silver spoon will continue to do well in life and this is the kind of tools we use i don't want to go there i, I want to talk about what you see on the left uh, the right hand side okay so that's that's the kind of things i want to discuss about today and just to explain that what i want to talk about is this painting by rene magritte who's a french surrealist and this painting is called son of man obviously you can see why because of the apple and magritte believed that people are interested in what we cannot see i think that when we look around us in life there are 
layers upon layers on everything. And underneath these layers is what I want to do. Right? I want to go behind the layers. Why? Because I think economic phenomena underlies lots of everyday activities. And I want to dig behind the layer. I want to go behind the apple to show you what is there. That's sort of mm. the philosophy of this. So okay. let me start with basically everybody who has done any economics or has heard of economics, but even you know, all around us in life, we know incentives matter, right? So you know, uh, we have commissions, we have bonuses, we have salary raises, people fight for corner office, people fight for window office, we give employee of the month award. What is all this? This is all incentive. Even attendance <laughs> in colleges. Yes. Yes, we want people to come to class. Attendance, Attendance. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Now, I don't know how many of you know this guy. He's a guy called uh, Abhishek Upamanyu. So, uh, and, I, and I think I strongly recommend people uh, who want to understand human behavior to listen to stand-up comedy. This is my newest recommendation. Why? Because these guys put human behavior under a microscope. So, I don't watch much TV, but a few days back, I was listening to Abhishek Upamanyu on YouTube. You know, the short snippets. So he remembers this story where his mother was telling him when they were kids, long ago again, uh, that, you know, it's your grandmother's death anniversary. So go give some food to the poor. Mm. Now, Abhishek Upamanyu says, it's a good thing the poor don't realize this. Because if they <laughs> really, the death of grandmothers means free food, guess what's going to happen to elderly people? Right. Said, okay, this is this is you know this is a one-time example. Let me give you many more examples. So during the British Raj, Delhi, a palace of cobras. So mm. the Angres, in their wisdom, decided, you know, we will give people money to bring us dead cobras. Mm. Turns out cobras are not very difficult to raise, or at least that's what the Delhiites thought. So <laughs> they started raising cobra to go give it to the British. Cobra farms. Now this is. <laughs> Bilkul. So this is anecdotal. There's no uh, documented evidence, but there is documented evidence for this in Vietnam. Mm. So under the French colonial rule, the city of Hanoi had a lot of rats. Mm. And so the French uh, decided that they will pay the Vietnamese for dead rats. Mm. So people of Hanoi just started rearing rats at home, bringing dead rats to the government to get money. Mm. Right? So what happens after some time, what happens after some time, the governments in both countries, the story goes, realize that maybe this is not a good idea. So suddenly you stop the policy. Now, can you imagine what would have happened? Most likely, the number of cobras or rats. the number of rats actually would have yeah. right? So what I want to point out is that when you're designing policy, whether it's a marketing campaign or it's government policy, you have to be very careful about how you're doing this and you have to think about second order effects. So let me point out a very recent example of something like this. So there, in the middle of the, uh, no, let me actually tell you. So then the book, there is something about the Sudanese civil war. Let me mm. tell you a story I heard recently uh, from the Dean of uh, Jindal. Mm. So he was telling me a story he heard from um, UN peacekeeping force so in Afghanistan, mm. suddenly they decided they'll pay people, all these warlords, money to surrender weapons. Mm. So these guys then would go to Quetta, buy the weapons for cheap, and come and sell because the UN was more offering more money than the cost of the weapons. Right. So they decided to go to Quetta and they Pakistan keep buy weapons, come and surrender. Yeah, five times surrender, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I have an so, anecdotal, anecdotal example on which is a sarcasm on our profession academics. So you suddenly realize that the whole world and especially the Asian countries woke up to something called publishing in middle of 2000. Right? So 2004, 5, 6, suddenly everybody woke up, there is something called ranking. And in order to get a good QS ranking, you need publications. So what happened was that Chinese people, as usual, this again anecdotal, so I'm just not confirming it realize that only way they can publish is to find a co-author from US. So Chinese government was paying them truckload of dollar money to get published. Now these guys on their own, because of whatever odd reasons, they were not, uh, you know, they needed the 
understanding of the publishing world. They needed to have papers of that quality. At the same time, they also needed some marquee, uh, you know, <laughs> professors to work with. So they will have some six people <laughs> writing the paper. Middle of that six is one US professor. And then everybody is sharing the booty because the US guy is not getting money to get published. He's okay getting published because he's already a tenured or whatever. And he's part of his resume. The Chinese guy is getting truckload of money. Now, something very unfunny has started happening in India today on the same lines, wherein there are some people in certain institutions that realize that they also have to pay money for faculty to publish it. Perfect. You know, that same model. Only to realize that they don't have the wherewithal to do it. So now there are people who are behind the scene writers <laughs> who are being approached by the academic or the writer is approaching the academic saying that boss, let's write the paper. I'm the ghost writing. So I'm ghost writing the paper. You get 4 lakh rupees. It gets published in a star, a star journal. To some of you guys who don't understand academics, this is how the rankings of the <laughs> journal happen. But incentives matter in, uh, in unintended consequences. This has started happening in this profession also. <laughs> and I will verify that the Chinese story, I know a couple of people to yes. whom this has happened. Happen. They don't pay the academics money. What yeah. they do is they offer them visits to China. Visits. So yeah. You go, you spend some China, they, you know, then they'll say, Chalo, we'll arrange your sightseeing and all of these kinds of Some things. lectures. So that story, yeah, that story is true. Chali. So, so that was one of the facets I wanted to explore. Let me move on a little bit to talk about something more important, information asymmetry. And this is actually a very, very serious problem because whenever economic transactions happen, not everybody has the same level of information. When you go to your doctor, for example, the doctor knows more about right. your health than you ever mm. will do. That's why it's important to have a credible doctor because you know he can he can make any, whatever recommendation and you have no option but to follow. Or you know you think about an expert hedge fund right. manager. You know that's a new story <laughs> these days. You think about a hedge fund manager and they make a recommendation, right? You have you do not have the ability to judge that. Mm. So what we want to talk about is two facets of information asymmetry. Mm. That moral is hazard. adverse selection and moral hazard. Right. What is adverse selection? Adverse selection is a very simple idea. Suppose, and this goes back to the beginnings of the health insurance industry. Now, mm. you know, we know how to work, but in the beginning, suppose you started selling health insurance. What will happen? What will happen is people who are healthy will not buy health insurance because they are not paying the premium, right? So people who will buy health insurance, people who know that they are going to be sick. So the insurance company after one year realizes this is not working because you know these people are falling sick. I need to raise the premium. You raise the premium, what will happen? People who are slightly less sick will say, well, with the new premium, it's not mm. worth it for me to buy. Right. They will drop out. So the remaining pool is even worse than the original pool. And this is the idea of adverse selection. You keep raising the premium mm. and the price uh, and the pool of people who want to buy worse and worse. So, of course, the way to solve this problem is to offer a menu of insurance contracts, different prices, different coverage, and people will self-select. Mm. That's the solution that the theorists came up with. Mm. Right? So, this information asymmetry is called adverse selection. The other type of uh, information uh, asymmetry that can happen is moral hazard. So, what is moral hazard? Moral hazard is the idea that uh, you, because you're not being monitored, you do not put in the necessary amount of effort, right? So that's mm. why we have all these contracts. That's why your boss has to look over your shoulder, whether you are doing the work or not, and things like that. Yeah. Or, or the most uh, instance of moral hazard is when seat belts were first introduced in the United States, uh, people found out that the drivers actually felt more comfortable with the seat belt and they would take more risks. As a result, driver deaths went down Pedestrian deaths went up. So this is another example of moral hazard. So why am I mentioning this? I am mentioning this because of these problems, lending to the poor is very difficult. Mm. So mm. the poor don't have a credit rating. We have right. no way of knowing uh, what is their credit worth, mm. number one. Number two, they have no collateral. Yeah. So, you know, if, if you 
well, maybe maybe Vijay Malia got away with it. Uh, but if you think about it, if you if you put your house on mortgage and you default on the loan, what will happen? The bank yep. basically seizes your asset. You can't do right. that with the poor because they have nothing, nothing to yeah. put as a collateral. Mm. Yeah. So this makes lending to the poor very difficult. And in fact, in the beginning, when um, you know all over the world in developing countries, they started these agricultural banks. In India, we have Nabad mm. and all. Nabad and all were incredibly unsuccessful, mm. and that was for two reasons. One was that the, they had all these types of issues. And the second problem was that it turned out that the poor people were sort of very afraid and reluctant to engage with the formal sector. Right. Okay. So now I want to talk about this man, mm. Muhammad Yunus. Mm. Okay. So this is actually the first chapter of the book. It's called One for All and All for One, the motto of the three muskets of it. Yunus put this idea together. In the Grameen. Right. So, Deepta, just so a sec. Uh, you have to come a little closer because I think we're losing your voice uh, in between. Okay. That's better. Thank all you. Right. All right. Yeah. So, 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 when he was teaching in Dhaka University, mm. Yunus realized that there was this woman who basically needed $50, kind of, for a sewing machine. Mm. He realized that that small amount of money mm. can make a dramatic change to the lives of these poor people. But it's very difficult to give these people $50. How do you lend to them? How do you recover the money? So he came up with the idea of Grameen Bank, which mm. is people form a group themselves right. and come borrow the money. The key mm. feature of this mm. idea was everybody is responsible for the loan. Okay. Mm. So now let's work through an example to understand why this matters. Okay. On one hand, we have these card players. They like gambling. So I would call them the risky type. Okay. So these are the this is the risky type. Right. Okay. On the other hand, you have me and you have somebody like this. Okay. Mm. Now you know I'm a safe <laughs> kind of guy. I'm a very serious guy. I'm a safe kind of guy. Now Mohit is the same. So what will happen once you make these kinds of rules that people have to form their own group? They will have to come and follow, and they're responsible for loans. Mm. So Mohit is thinking, okay, do I want to go? Do I want to go with this guy? He says, okay. If I go with these gamblers, if they lose the money, I have to pay their loan. Mm. I'd rather go for this guy because I know he's hardworking, he's going to do the job. So right. what will happen is that the bank does not have to know whether we are good or bad. Yep. The borrowers that come to the bank will automatically select themselves. They have, in the village, everyone has information about everyone else. So everyone will find their safe partner and they will make sure that good people are borrowing. Moreover, if I want to take the loan and run away and default on it, mm. that's not going to happen. So if I work hard, I made money, mm. I just want to make sure that I repay my loan. Mm. Otherwise, he has to pay it. And the same works for me. I mean, if Moe tries, mm. tries to pull a fast one on me, Mm. I'll catch him because not only will I catch him, I also know Dwari and I'll tell Dwari, look, Mohit did this, don't talk to him. Yeah. Okay. So that's the other thing that happens in a village because right. it's a community. Community. Everyone else. Yeah. So you can punish this person. Mm. You can, bef you know, he can be befriended, I mean, he, he can be defriended by a whole group of people. Mm. Right. So that's the information channel mm. that Grameen tapped into mm. and was able to make group lending successful uh, repayment rates for group lending programs and similar programs mm. all over the world are over 95%. Mm. And in fact, now serious banks like city banks actually give money to Grameen to loan out because the interest rates, yeah. these organizations charge actually over 25%, uh, yeah, around pretty 25%. High. Pretty high. Yeah. Pretty high. Pretty the high. only thing is they are better than the Sahuka. They're yeah. cheaper than the village money. Village money lender. Mm. Yeah. So that's what's going on here, right? So, mm. uh, so that's another example of how information matters. Right. So uh, closer to this, uh, you know, uh, topic, uh, Sudipta's very good question has come. So what I'll do is that I will keep on having these uh, conversations and the questions rather than you know saving them in the end. So Sanya Gandhi has got a very interesting. What if all the gamblers make a group and take the loan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank you. So there is a term in economics for this idea. It's uh, called positive associative matching. Right. Positive associative matching suggests 
the safe borrowers will pair with safe borrowers and risky borrowers will pair mm. with risky borrowers because borrowers. the borrower will want to pair with a risky borrower. Ah, so so they... if you think about this, what will happen? Yeah. What will happen is this safe, safe, and risky risky. risky, okay. risky. The cross pairing will never happen. Mm. This cross pairing will never happen. Mm. Okay, so now it's possible that all the risky borrowers mm. form a group together, they come and they ask mm. for money. Now, in a village setting, Gramini usually has an agent who is local. Okay, so that agent will have an idea, may refuse a loan. But suppose the agent is not local, these guys mm. will borrow the money. Mm. Okay, then what will happen? They will default. Yeah. If they default, there are no future loans. So one of the things that Grameen relies on is dynamic okay. incentives. It means there's a future, there is mm. tomorrow. So if you, what they do, these programs are usually set up in a staggered way. Mm. You pay it back, you can get a bigger loan. The mm. idea is if you want to grow your business and if you're doing well in business, yeah. you need more and more capital. Yep. You start out small, show that you're a good businessman or businesswoman, then mm. get a little more and a little more and so on. Mm. So the risky types will cut and they're out. All right. So, you know, in that sense, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, interesting dynamics plays around, not just in the lending. You know, I personally witnessed this whole group dynamics of a community uh, in a community setting started happening when the Modi government launched something called Swachh Bharat Mission in building toilets. Now, it's very interesting anecdotal because I, I researched that uh, uh, personally, ethnographically, I visited villages. I stayed there. I, I looked at how things were happening. So what was very interesting was that money was given to build toilets. Okay. But earlier scheme was very interesting. You show the photo of the toilet, you get money. But the money was only 1,500, rupiah. Manmohan Singh government allocated under Nirmal Bharat Abhiyan, rupiah toilet. It's like incentive to build the toilet. Now they, they never had the incentive to build the toilet because they were not interested in doing it because it was a behavioral change problem, you know? So the whole village built one. <laughs> took the photograph, <laughs> took the photograph, everybody got paid. 1500 rupees and then they used it for uh, putting their goats and cows and everybody in that toilet was never used. Now the Modi government pulled out a fast one on these guys. They said these guys, they knew the data, what happened. First one, by the time the technology had changed. So you cannot produce a physical photograph. You have to put up a digital photograph. The digital photograph is also geotagged. So ek jaga ka photo dikha ke kar sakte, first. Second, individual never will never get the money. So what is happening is that they will get the money, which is direct benefit transfer, but only when every other guy in the village has already built the toilet. Which means there, there are 70% exactly. of people who have built the toilet and 30% have not built the toilet. They will, so none, none of them will get the money. Okay. <laughs> so then the 70% will put up a pressure on the 30% saying that how dare you not do it because we have already committed and we are waiting for that money. And then toilet will, the money will come after the toilet is getting built. And the third filter, which is a behavior change filter was the fact that we will not give you money just because you built the toilet. You have to use it consistently. We will check it after three months when the village becomes ODF, which is open defecation free, then we'll get the money. And that's why it is a success in, 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 our, in rural areas because the community, what you're talking about in this particular case, the information asymmetry and the adverse one, the moral hazard was then used against those people who were the defaulters, who were the defaulters in this case. And that's why in many cases, it's a success, it, it's a success in that sense. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, what I will suggest is that in fact what will happen is if you're not building the other people might not only will they pressure you they might even offer to help right because at that point you've already built yours so it's creating this community spirit that okay let's go build the toilet so that we can get done and get paid so this happened right. so yes, this yes. actually happened wherein there were below the poverty line people who didn't have money to build so the village pooled the money okay 
and the gram pradhan actually used this as an incentive that's why incentives matter to use it to build his or her social capital ki pradhan sahab ne toilet banwa diya so agle election mein use this built capital and pradhan knew that he can actually do it because the money is going to come back you see the point but pradhan knew that money will come back only when the 100% of the village is there so it's very incentive and and the group moral yeah, hazard yeah. thing which is being played around in this particular absolutely, case absolutely 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 so uh, so i hope mohit you noted that you have been tagged as a safe borrower <laughs> he said he's everybody listening now he's creating yeah, his own book everybody listening to this talk mohit is a safe borrower right okay. right so i'm going to move on uh, to yeah. other story so, yes <clears throat> i think not all audiences i speak to are familiar with this right so yes. when i am but some of them are some of them are uh. yeah when i'm speaking at investments people many people have never used this but you know i think some of us are familiar with it and what i want to talk about here is that you know technology is constantly changing and this actually goes back to what dwarka was saying that as technology changes and as life becomes more and more uh, what should i say uh, as we become more and more economically mobile we may communicate with each other less so over time we move from here to here right so what i want to say is if you remember the movie this was the story right dam laga ke haisha this was the story this the cd store was threatening this and if you think about the technology parallels in our life we started with doordarshan at some point one channel multiple channels now we have streaming devices and what happens with that is that when you had one channel everybody watched the same show next morning everybody had one topic so just to take varika's example now everybody even within the same family is watching their own show so next morning at the breakfast table actually that common topic is missing so the more and more we use technology there are social repercussions of these things but the reason i wanted to bring that up is i want to talk about once upon a time the bar and i want to talk about these two things okay so netflix was born as a response to blockbuster what was the modus operandi of blockbuster blockbuster you you rented a video cassette and then you returned it if you didn't return it you paid a steep fine okay so the guy who started netflix was so fed up with paying fines that he decided he wants to start a service where there was no fine so in the initial days netflix worked in you they would send you a cd you or dvd you watch the dvd you return it then you get the new dvd so you can take 3 weeks to watch your dvd no late fees so why am i talking about this because i want to talk about a very interesting pricing strategy mm. that stores were following so deep stores that rented out dvd and um video cassettes were following a particular strategy what was the strategy and i noticed this at least in in one store when i this was when i was a student i give you a movie they would rent a movie to you for 50 cents okay mm. you can go return it the next day or rent it the next day for 50 cents again but suppose mm. you did not rent it for mm. 50 cents you failed to show up and re-rent mm. it Mm. charge you a late fee of one dollar. Mm. This is problematic. Why? Because you're willing to rent it to me for fifty mm. cents, but the late fee is one dollar. In other words, the late fee exceeds the opportunity right. cost. Do Why that. Why would you? Mm. This is my, and this is the story of my very first published paper. So here is what happens. So imagine a college town like the kind of town I lived in, where most of the population is two types: either students or faculty that teach them. Okay. faculty have a high value of time students have a lower value of time so they will do things that faculty will say okay i don't have time to do this now so what the video store will do they will reduce the price of a video so everyone will rent more videos then faculty will get a shock to their time so something came up your child fell sick you suddenly remembered you haven't prepared for tomorrow's lecture or mm. something and you realize oh, the fine is for 1 dollar i don't uh. care okay the phd student or the undergraduate student will say It's one dollar. Let me go return it. It only takes ten minutes. I'll go return it and re, or I'll go re-rent it and come fifty cents. I'll save my fifty cents. The professor says, "Forget it. I'll pay the fine." So, under the dis, if there are enough professors, right, relative to 
and the distribution of cost shock of time to the two different mm. is different, then True. the retail store should actually reduce the price and make more money through late fees. Right. The so credit card companies also do this. And there's a paper that was uh, yeah. published in a financial, in review financial yeah. study something, where what they do is they show to attract customers, you charge to reduce lower interest rate, reduce the interest rate, but tag on all kinds of fees. Right? And make money through so these types of things actually happen around us. So for people from the marketing world, this is way to think that how firms can drive a wedge between customers of different types. I think uh, uh, some of this is also being used by Gillette, uh, the two part uh, or the or the or the printer companies, for example, wherein they would reduce the barrier to use. So printers, for example, HP did it for 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 say for for decades, where they would reduce the cost of acquiring a printer so cheap that they're making in my time i remember when i used to you know uh, be into retail I, I was a salesman in in, in selling these uh, printers would make 300 bucks so we would make 300 bucks i'm talking about 25 years ago we used to make 300 bucks on a hp printer to be sold for 4000 rupees or something but we knew that uh, we will because now you're hooked right so we will make money more money on the cartridges same happens in Gillette, for example, when you get used to the razor in a particular kind and they keep on upping it. So once you are a Mark III, you can't go to Mark II, and you got a Mark IV, you can't go to Mark III. So they create the barriers, for example, in that particular sense, and they're captive. Then you are captive because you have to use that again and again in a particular sense. So that does happen. That yeah. does happen. Uh, meanwhile, there are some interesting questions which has come on the previous discussion, uh, so, Deepta, so I, I think I will just bring it. So Ila Joshi has... Uh, yeah. Uh, come up very very interesting uh, example about uh, what China is doing, right? So uh, they have a uh, interesting way of recovering loans from the people. An app is used which shows how many people in the vicinity and how many debt they have. So Ola kind of a thing, you know. Uh, naming and shaming is another way. So uh, it used to be done uh, in in many places, and uh, authoritarian government is using to recover the loan. Economies are naming shaming. So economies are naming and shaming uh, uh, is being done in that particular sense. It's also being done in Swachh Bharat Mission. So just to Illa tell you that uh, those people who have never built the toilet were essentially with their names are announced in the evening panchayat <laughs> in by, uh, uh, you know, microphone and others. Uh, Jamshid uh, has got uh, a very interesting comment about network structure of safe borrowers uh, versus lenders in this vein. Although individually agents are safe, uh, they may be they may be risky in terms of the whole network. I mean, structurally risky network and safe agents may cause safe agents avoid borrow lend because of the panic towards the fully uh, connected relationships and propagating cascading effects. So uh, he has a comment on that. Uh, and the third one, Mr. P. Mehta is saying, uh, Mr. Mason. So let me uh, quickly respond to the first two comments. First right? one, very quickly. Yeah, yeah. Very quickly, I'll respond to the first two comments. So yep, the first yes. one. Absolutely, that's peer recognition, right? Uh, so there are many stories like that. Uh, you know, that's why I was saying employee of the month is exactly that. Mm, that uh, and yeah. I, uh, I read, uh, remem I remember reading a story about uh, taxation. There was a mm. town in Andhra Pradesh, I forget which one. What they would do is if you had not paid taxes, they would send these drummers to stand in front of your house and beat the <laughs> drums all to the tax people. Mm. So, so, so these things, uh, yes, and, uh, and very powerful motivators. And now coming to uh, second question was the second question is basically about systemic systemic risk, which we call mm. systemic risk, and what we call idiosyncratic risk. Right. Uh, so systemic risk is the risk that affects the whole village. Right. So right. This cannot protect against systemic risk. This can only protect against idiosyncratic risk. And in fact, when you partner with a safe borrower, what you want to do, strictly speaking is find a partner whose income stream is orthogonal to yours. Now I'm using mm. technical language, mm. but basically what it is saying is you don't want to partner with another farmer. Mm. Okay? Mm. Because if the farmer is affected, your income and their income are simultaneously affected. Yep, affected. And the payment of the loan is going to be affected. So you want right. to find somebody as a whose income is negatively correlated with yours. So when they have a shock, you mm. probably don't have a shock. You can repay both loans. And when you have a shock, they don't have a shock. So you can repay both. Loans. So they can repay both. Loans. So it can work in, in very, very hypothetically. It can also work in relationships, right? So 
you you pick up you pick up or 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 have alliance with a partner who is in complimentary you can take more risks other person says steady job so you know so yeah so professors Bilkul. are in demand sudipta <laughs> they won't earn much but this income is steady right and then another person can take the risk and go ahead and do that uh, there is an interesting comment which has come from uh, p mehta Uh, which is the larger comment so probably we'll take it up later about today's scenario how economy is working in progress or development of common people so we'll take it up little later on that sense uh, yeah, sure. so uh, i have a very interesting and that's how uh, i i first read your article and 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 realized that you have interesting stories to tell uh, from a day to day anecdotal stuff and building an economic logic around it uh, because that's what i also do uh, in studying human behavior is about chappal chori so i would really want you to talk about uh, this whole chappal chori uh, the incident with all of us know the pehle to hamara generation thoda religious hai mandir mandir jata tha mosque and every place we keep the shoes out but uh, tell us this whole chappal chori economic logic so so the idea of chappal so again the chappal chori story started when i was reading a newspaper piece and i saw that this is a story that was reported that in a town in sweden called malmo which is where the mm. curve Mm-hmm. Wallander sits. Those who watch Wallander, uh, what the police noticed is that the thieves were breaking store windows and stealing shoes displayed in the store windows. Mm. Now, what right. was weird was that these are only the shoes for the left leg. Mm. So the police was very puzzled. What will you do with you know left pair shoes? Mm. You need the right pair to actually wear them. Mm. Turns out across the border, because Malmo is a border town, across the border in Denmark. The store windows always display right shoes. <laughs> so these thieves were pan Scandinavian thieves operating in Sweden and Denmark, mm. stealing shoes from both places, putting together designer shoes. Right, selling it off. Yeah. Right. Mm. So this is it's a very important idea in uh, economics mm. and in everyday life. Everyday life. Let me give you chai and adda. Right. Uh, uh, chai and uh, matri, chai and biscuit. Mm. You know, complimentary. Complimentary. Mm. complimentary mm. goods why is this important so imagine a call center guy without the phone mm. or imagine a computer programmer without the computer computer also there is a exact fit right so if you have one computer programmer and 20 computers your output will not increase similarly if you have 20 programmers and one computer your output will not increase right so many economic phenomena require the right amount of pairing to get this done and of course this story also goes back to the time when i was a student in uh, delhi school and professor koshik basu used to give me a ride back home mm. sometimes he used mm. to give me noida mm. back then mm. not noida uh, patpad ganj and i and i used to uh, live in mayur vihar so he would right. give me a ride and we discuss these stories and you know his solution which many of you have figured out was very interesting i mean and I, in the book i recommend don't wear your fancy shoes to the mandir or mosque or whatever <laughs> Because they are likely to be stolen, so keep some right. chappals. And there are people who have started offering that service. Keep your shoes in the car, yeah. where uh. rent the chappals from, or you just take your shoes, put one shoe in one part of the temple, and the other shoe in the other part of the temple. So the yeah, the so thief will have the same problem. Ye so these are hai. some solutions. Yeah. एक बार एक बार यू नो इट हैपेंड विद मी मैं आई वाज गोइंग फ्रॉम बॉम्बे टू बैंगलोर टू अटेंड वन ऑफ माय बेस्ट फ्रेंड्स वेडिंग दिस इज 20 इयर्स बैक एंड आई हैड सम वेरी फैंसी इंटरेस्टिंग बूट्स एंड आई गॉट ऑन द ट्रेन एट वीटी स्टेशन एंड बाय द टाइम द ट्रेन रीच सम प्ले हाफ एन आवर व्हाट एवर आई स्लेप्ट एंड आई रियलाइज दैट माय शूज आर गॉन राइट so so 24 hour journey without shoes i reached bangalore the first thing i did was call my friend and said bring your shoes first so she got her father's shoes for me so that i could have them but after that i became very very smart so whenever i would travel in the trains and other things which i did many times i would keep just one shoe behind and ek upar sir mein lag ke sone ka exactly dono so, nahi because you don't have space for that yeah, you yeah. could you so, could you could do that so that's an interesting uh idea about it and uh, okay so, so i have, i found yeah please go ahead go ahead go ahead to mention one other thing because this goes to the, so the fact that production processes are complementary think about supply chain so many production pro- yeah 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 processes 
the commentary. And so Michael Kremer, even before supply chains became important, he got the Nobel Prize last year yeah. with Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo. In 1993, he wrote a paper called The O-Ring Theory of Development. Ah, yes. What is the O-Ring Theory of Development? The O-ring theory of development basically takes the example of the space shuttle Challenger, mm. which blew up because of a faulty O-ring. O-ring is a small, what we call bearing, mm. okay? Uh, it's a small component in the space shuttle, mm. but the entire space shuttle mm. blew up because of that. So in a supply chain or in any kind of production process- The weakest The weakest link. link. Mm. Yeah, because production is complementary. The weakest link can pull you down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is the thing that mm. uh, Michael Kremer was talking about. And then mm. he talks about how that affects development. Mm. And also, one of the most important um, sort of implications of this is brain drain. You mm. take the person of same productivity, put mm. them in a team of higher productivity, the mm. total team output will go up and yeah. the person will get paid more. So the, mm. the same person, when they move from India to the United States for the same work, will get a higher mm. salary. That's one of the implications. Mm. Of the same, impressive. yeah. The same, the same reason why you get better mangoes in US than in India, right? Yes, I mean, so, <laughs> so, so the opportunity cost is different for the guy in the US. So let's and so so the, let's talk about why US gets better mangoes than in India. Why you mentioned that in your book? Uh, so yes. we mango man, we don't get our mangoes. You 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 uh, you know, a non mango man gets more mangoes, right? So sorry. <laughs> so you tell us. an expensive mango that's equal to a lot of inexpensive mangoes mm. okay volume so size mm. volumes so, so because you know say one is one so a cheaper mango so one alfonso may be equal to four other mangoes mm. so for the indian they are giving up four other mangoes okay whereas for for the american given their purchasing power and the cost of exporting these things by the time you add a fixed cost of exporting let's say his he gets the exported mango at a better deal. So it turns out that given their purchasing power, the Alfonso works out to be a better deal in the US mm. than in India. So it's a better deal for the American and the other mangoes are a better deal for the Indian. So people who want to make profits are just mm. going to follow that. So, so Infosys did the same when they build their outsourcing model? Yes, I think that's part of it. And also, um, yeah, no, actually, yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. Because, um, you know, you, you just go where the relative cost of the worker is cheaper. And that's why the manufacturing moved to China, right? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, the very yeah, reason manufacturing yeah. moved to China because of that hedge. Yeah, yeah uh, exactly. That hedge. So that's, Isn't it? That's, that is why we live in a global economy. market. Mm. It's going to keep happening. I mean, right. next, it might move out of China to Vietnam, right? Now people are talking mm. about Vietnam is cheaper. It doesn't have the volume yeah, so, uh, of Chinese workforce, but so 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 the data which is today is being presented uh, about post-COVID, uh, if uh, X percentage of that have moved out to different countries beyond China, uh, Vietnam has the lion's share of thirty-three uh, percent. India has better uh, investments, but in terms, India has got only ten percent of that pie, uh, where the supply chains have moved closer home or to different geographies. Uh, just to de-risk themselves, uh, just to uh, 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 de-risk themselves. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna change the track here, Sudipta, and ask about something very different. And I'm gonna fox you because you don't know I'm gonna ask this question. So all along, in your conversation, and I know that you are a game theory, uh, you know, expert in that sense. And it, so we'll talk about that uh, incident also in Turkey. Uh, but it's a common thread. So a lot of times you mention in your book and that's what for the readers, you know. Uh, so I want you to first, uh, because there are a lot of non-economic people also, they keep hearing and most of them have seen the beautiful mind uh, of John Nash. Tell us what is first very basic, dumb, like somebody like me who doesn't understand economics. Uh, what is game theory first? And then I'm going to ask you a very, very interesting question from the mythology and the game theory being played there. 
So the question is a trick question, but you first tell us what is game theory because it's a very common thread in your book and it's been explained beautifully by you. Uh, but I really want the you know our listeners and and, and our audience here to also understand uh, why in day to day life, right from the uh, stone paper scissors we've been playing, how exactly the game theory plays around in our lives. So game theory. So you know we think of decisions as two types of decisions. One is individual decision. So you make the decision and the decision affects you. So there are situations where you have to make a decision, but the final outcome doesn't depend only on your own decision. It also depends on the decisions of other people, right? So take uh, rock, paper, scissors, or uh, tic-tac-toe, or take the game of chess. All of these are games because whether you win or not depends not only on how you do, mm. but also how the other person mm. does. Mm. So, when it, so any situation, mm. so a war between Coke and Pepsi, mm. yeah, price war, okay? uh, or or you know any of the big any of the big corporations mm. fighting, that's a game. Advertising wars. Species competing for the same territory. Right. So biology also uses game theory. Explaining elections, explaining voter behavior uses right. game theory. Military strategy. Right. Mm. So if a certain general is going to place their armies in this particular manner, this is how mm. they're going to allocate. Mm. What are you going to do to allocate your army to win the game? Right? Mm. So a lot of situations around us are like this. Mm. And these are all games of different kinds. So you can imagine that maybe your boss thinks, okay, this guy is trying not, he's going to try and get maximum salary without working least. Okay. Mm. So your boss has to design an incentive scheme for you so that you will come apply in such a way that it works out for both. Right. So so let me give an example of this. Um, suppose we need pollution to create some pollution to develop. Okay. Mm. So then everybody says, look, you know, I am not going to give up my pollution. My country needs development. Mm. So I'm going to take a little bit of pollution to push development because it comes to grow. Unfortunately, all developing countries reason like that. And mm. we end up with a lot of pollution. Okay. Or somebody says, I'm going to ignore climate change because it suits me. But then yeah. everybody yeah. is reason yeah. just like you. So that's Same. one of the most famous games in game theory. Mm. I just explained to you. Or if you want another example, the beauty industry. Mm. The beauty industry has managed to persuade women that they need to use beauty mm. products, mm. right? So if somebody is not, if other women are not using beauty products, you feel that if you use, you will somehow win the race. Mm. Okay? But unfortunately, everybody uses believes that, and then people give up the natural look, go for the beauty product. I mean, that's basically why fair and lovely works. Yeah. Okay. Now it's bold. Okay. That's an example. Bold and lovely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something. Yeah, it's the name has changed, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the name has changed. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so we're running short of time. Yeah. So, so that's time that's... now. So Mohit has given us a hard stop, uh, another ten minutes. Uh, so, so my question was very simple about the game theory happened in Mahabharata when the last time Krishna went to Duryodhana and says, "This is my offer." Give us seven villages, five villages, we'll go. So what is really happening? Is it information asymmetry here? What is this guy thinking about if I don't give? It's easy way to get in, right? And get on with it. And they ended up, so how are they playing around this game? What was really happening there? So, yeah, so I have to think about alternative explanations. I mean, my immediate mm -hmm. uh, answer to you would be that probably, uh, you know, these are probabilistic outcomes. So Duryodhan did his mm -hmm. own calculation and he decided that the strategy I follow is higher payoff than the other strategy. That's mm. that's my guess, but I have to spend some time thinking through this. Think about there it. There might be that, other explanations. other explanations, and 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 we can actually make a, a game theory probabilistic about. Chances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can set up a game. Yeah, so I have to I set up a game there. Yeah, yeah. That was my immediate response, but I have to think about it harder. So yeah, you can, great. Yeah, you uh, so we have uh, so few more examples from your uh, side. Uh, we have ten minutes uh, to. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll something cover, very we'll interesting. Cover, yeah, we'll cover one or two and not, not all of them. Sure. So let me talk about this one. So, mm. you know, one of the mm. things people say about Indians is you know, they don't want to let others go ahead. 
right? Somebody yeah. starts to uh, better, then the others will pull him down. Uh -huh. So, I mean, in the book, I talk about the story of a crab exporter who was exporting crabs without covering the lids because right. the story is, oh, if one of them tries to escape, these are Indian crabs. If one tries to escape, the others will pull him down. Right? So, <laughs> Indians are accused of being uh, having this type of crab mentality. The question right. is, is this really true? Mm. I mean, do we really have crab mentality? So mm. first thing I want to observe is that India is composed of many different groups. Okay. Mm. So if you if you look at um, something called Ethnic Fractionalization Index, which was developed right. by uh, Alberto Lasigna from Harvard, uh, India is very high, very high. on fractional. Mm. We are very divided society. Mm. Uh, More on the linguistic divided, side. We are very, very heterogeneous, right? Yeah, very heterogeneous. More on the linguistic society. side. Yeah? yeah. More on the linguistic side. Exactly. More on the linguistic side. Exactly. More on the linguistic side. So we have lots of groups. And so when you have lots of groups, there is a lot of in-group, out-group feeling. Okay. So part of it, because we have so many groups, I think this comes from there. The other thing is that, you know, which behavioral economics has made important, right? Really keeping up with your neighbors, right? So standard economics is to argue that, uh, you know, what matters is your own payoff, but no, actually your relative uh, payoffs matter. So that's the sense in which there is some truth to the argument that uh, Indians may be, there may be some reasons why uh, we like to bring others down. But I want to give you a slightly different reason, okay? Mm. And this mm. reason has to do with complementarity. Now imagine mm. you are in the football team, uh, which has got uh, Pele, okay? Now Pele mm. got bought out, Pele is getting an offer from another club. Mm. Now, you may be jealous he will leave, but there may be another reason here. Mm. That is, if Pele leaves, your club's performance will go down. Yeah. In terms of the complementarity, he is a very, this is a very key person. They are holding the whole team together. Mm. If that person leaves, your income is getting affected. Mm. So you may not want him to leave. You may want to sabotage their departure, not mm. because you're jealous, because of purely selfish reasons. So mm. I want people to understand that maybe not all of it is driven by jealousy okay That's some bit of so, it some bit yeah of it. so if you have done this kind of thing you have some defense for yourself you can now <laughs> tell yourself okay i didn't do it because of i know okay. but this is what has happened with, with with messi right there's a leak on his uh, payment which has just come out because nobody wants him yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. to leave leave barcelona yeah. uh, you know uh, because yeah. he has to pay those taxes and things like this All right go ahead so, so i will not go over the table of contents um, mm -hmm. and i think Given the time limit, I want to skip this. So this is a story about why we give, uh, you know, why we offer the first piece of cake or the first thing to a guest. Okay. Mm. Mm. Why we say Atiti Devo Bhava. So, mm. so this has to do with something my daughter did with one of her friends. And so then she got scolded. And then I started thinking because mm. evolutionary pressure suggests we should give the first piece of cake to ourselves. You know, otherwise mm. we might die. Just eat. First, keep yourself alive. Economic efficiency suggests find out who is hungry. Hungry. Hungry person should get the first piece of cake. Right. Then why, why do we give it to the guests? The reason we go against mm. all this type of reasoning, I think, mm. is because you want to impress somebody. Mm. If you want to start a new business relationship, right? What do you do? You try to oblige them. You try to impress yeah. them. Offer it to them. It's like going on a date, the first date. You're on your best yeah. manners, which is why we make it part of manners to offer it to the other people. Mm -hmm. You can also imagine that this can be cultural. Why? It can be cultural because in the old days, trade was difficult. So if mm -hmm. your community did not develop a culture of hospitality, the mm -hmm. trade caravans would bypass. Right. So if you were nice, to them, they would stop in your town, bringing you new goods, products, ideas, and of course, diseases too. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, also argue, why do we say Atithi Deva Bhava? Atithi Deva Bhava happens, in my opinion, because when food is scarce, mm. you might want to eat the food mm. and not leave it for your guest. Mm. So if we put the guest on the same pedestal as God, now what have we done? We have designated this as God's food. The first offering would now go to the God. Mm. So now you have made it God's food. So you can't eat it even if you're hungry. So it's a <laughs> pre-committed device. You burn yeah. the brick, there is yeah. no going back. Yeah. yeah. I want to talk about a game that's playing out right now yeah. everywhere. This is a game that politicians love to play. It's a game of chicken. What's the game of chicken? It's a game where reputation is more important than dying. So how do we think about it? So imagine two people sitting in front of each other. They say, I'm going to hold my breath. 
the first person to give up is the loser okay so you have to keep on holding your breath and outlast the other guy of course if you hold right. it both hold it forever you are both dead yeah the so reputation is more important than okay yeah so so this happens between politicians right trump and uh, you know kim jong un they both said well when they negotiated you know both of them went back saying i won hmm. uh, you can imagine that so the story goes back to this movie rebel without a cause i'm not going to talk about it in the interest of time but hmm. the other one where we see this this is covid relevant any time hmm. there is a narrow space like a trail a jogging trail walking trail a shopping aisle we approach each other because social distancing the question is who is going to give way <laughs> it's exactly the game of chicken right one person there are two nash equilibria one mm. person giving way the other person mm. so either a gives way and b does not b gives way a does not that's, mm. that's so this is what happened with robin hood and mm. little john little john of course mm. yeah, if we look at what's happening between uh, the government no. and the negotiation <laughs> yeah neither right. group wants to give in both of them have give too in. much at stake yeah the farmers are perceived right? they don't want to back down the pm mm. has basically taken a position in they have dug themselves into a hole and there is no coming out of that so we're getting things mm. you know things are getting more and more ugly between both groups and nobody is backing mm. out yeah okay everybody knows kangana ranaut is known for her attitude or swagger why am i saying this in the game of chicken swagger is all important why because if you can persuade the other person you are crazy like yeah. you drink a bottle of vodka before you get into the car that is going to drive towards each other right. and the first person to swerve if that person sees that this person is drunk of what vodka or they've taken off the steering wheel from the car then yeah. there is no way you will swerve you will go crash right so immediately if at the beginning you establish yourself as having attitude or swagger then you will win in a game of chicken and these are these 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 kinds of things create reputation and they have effects in fact one of the reasons why mm. governments don't negotiate with terrorists because the minute you do it once mm. you're going to do you know, it once now we have seen it right so yeah we've yeah. seen it okay cool so we'll come absolutely so we'll come to the end of uh, this uh, book talk uh with professor sudipta sarangi and there was one question which we left uh, unanswered which is a, a very macro economic question by mr you, beta i will show you my last slide and yeah. i'll take it. yeah go ahead so i covered a lot of ground yeah so before we just end we'll just take 30 seconds uh, from you sudipta because that answer that question is a, a larger question a macro question about uh, being asked uh, by p mehta about in today's scenario and it's a very serious question about economy post covid how do you see the weak 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 curve coming up uh, in progress or development of common people so so what is your what is it that your uh, yeah so first few things sania a few others we will share professor sarangi's email id and we sudipta you can bring back that slide so that our audience can have a look and note it down uh, and uh, yes so finally how do you see things panning out now at a macro level across the board uh, and uh, predominantly because you follow india uh, what is what do you think as an economist that's going to happen in the next a uh, couple of months so um first i will have to say i am a micro theorist uh, which basically means that you know i analyze small phenomena and i live in uh, an ivory tower right so one part of me does those mathematical models extremely right. technical mathematical models but of mm. course i like to look at everyday life so i follow so you have to since i don't call myself knowledgeable on these matters so you should take whatever mm. whatever i say with a grain of salt so right. i think uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel which means mm. vaccines are happening mm. i think things will come under control i think the market sentiment is already starting to take that into account mm. okay the market sentiment is already starting to take into account that there is change of leadership in the power mm. and the global markets are taking that into account mm. 
So you see the market trend. Although there is still a bubble in the market that will autocorrect. In terms of the macro economy, I think that this is not a time to uh, you know, be weak. I think this is a time for Keynesian policies mm. because almost all global economies have experienced contraction. Right. Just like after World War II, this, yeah. is, this is a serious global phenomenon. Mm. So I think we have to, we have to have a serious fiscal package. Mm. The quantity and the duration of this fiscal passage, uh, package is beyond me. I will not go there. Mm. Uh, but I think we need uh, generous government fiscages. And the, well, and the reason I'm saying this is because we have to plan out, of course, you know, what that will do to future inflation and future national debt and so on. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I think we do need- At this point uh, of time, yeah, packages. we have to. Yeah, and then systematic, uh, you know, systematic uh, implementation of the vaccination and fiscal packages. And, you know, we need, the other thing this has shown us that we need multilateral institutions again. Mm. Because just in the World War II, Mm -hmm. We had multilateral institutions. That was the golden era of multilateral institutions. Yeah. I think this is showing us again, we need multilateral institutions, especially with regard to health, because mm -hmm. we now live in a network society. So any kind of disease is going to spread like this. Yeah. And then I think that the second thing is we have to think about resiliency in our supply chain. So we mm -hmm. have to think about backups and diversifying our inputs, source, right. how we source goods. Otherwise, supply chains will become very susceptible. So that's my brief answer to this really difficult question. Fair enough. Good. We won't hold you back because uh, it's, it's, it's already five minutes past uh, 8.30 and we thought that we'll finish it at 8.30. 8, uh, so thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure hosting all of you. If you have any questions for Professor Sarangi, his email ID is being given. Economies of small things, econ small things, gmail.com. There is a website called econsmallthings.com. And if you have something very, very yeah. interesting, like for example, I have a question for Sudipta. He will answer it later. That why do our mothers don't bargain in a sari shop, but will ask for that extra dhania and a mirchi and, <laughs> and nibu from that uh, tarkari wala every time the guy comes in. You know, so what is this behavior all about in that sense? So keep thinking the best question uh, wins a prize, uh, and he has said that he will never give this prize to me, so it's all yours. Ask as many weird, as many interesting, as many crazy questions as you can. And to all of you, uh, uh, good afternoon who are there in the other parts, and good evening for all of you. Khush rahiye, abad rahiye, achhe sa rahiye, mask pehniye, safe rahiye, aur agar abhi vaccine nahi laga hai, COVID is not gone anywhere else. Professor and, Dwarka. Uh, yes, Professor thank Nyan. you. Mm. We cannot uh, end this session till we have uh, Rishad from you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. Let's go ahead. I just wanted to say, if people send me questions on the website, please note that it doesn't show up immediately yeah. Yeah, because I want to care about language and so on. So I will have to approve the question. So don't feel like I'm not listening. I mean, the questions are not going anywhere. They are. Mm -hmm. So please uh, do that. So Sudipta started uh, in his conversation about one interesting behavioral pattern about what has happened in last 30 years in our lives, that from conversations uh, which are real, uh, which are in family or friends and others, uh, we have, our lives have shrunk uh, uh, to, an, to a nine inch screen. So I have a, I have a, uh, a insight on this, that what has really happened to us in this particular case. And that's why the most important thing in our lives today is not this book, your profession, your parents, uh, food. No, it's essentially your phone. But more important to your phone, especially the Gen Zs and others who are sitting here and some of our, my students, is actually phone ka charger. So this, this poem is not on phone. <laughs> this poem is on phone car charger. Uh, I wrote it a couple of years back, but it's very relevant today. That phone car charger, and it's in Hindi. So guys who don't understand, my apologies. Uh, Sudipta can uh, translate it later. Uh, phone car charger, hamari dorti bhakti no inch screen mekad zindagi ka parallel sa ban gaya hai. Har gali, nukkar, station, airport, घर या दुकान या कार में बस मोबाइल चार्जर की ही दरकार है हर जगह मोबाइल चार्जर चाहिए बॉस 
कि जैसे बैटरी खत्म हुई नहीं कि जीने के बाद मायने बदल जाएंगे कि जैसे ही बैटरी खत्म हुई नहीं कि जीने के मायने बदल जाएंगे रूखी रूठी सी हो जाएगी जिंदगी ब्लैंक स्क्रीन से कोई कैसे गुफ्तगु करे अब ब्लैंक स्क्रीन से कोई कैसे गुफ्तगु करे अगल बगल सभी तो अपने अपने स्क्रीन में मुंह गड़ाए बैठे हैं सिर उठा बमुश्किल मुस्कुरा दिए जैसे कोई कर्ज उतार दिया हो सिर उठा बमुश्किल मुस्कुरा दिए जैसे कोई कर्ज उतार दिया हो बस अब यूं ही खाली बैठे सोचने की कुछ समझने की आदत भी छूट गई है कुछ इंचों में जिंदगी कैसे सिमट जाती है कुछ इंचों में जिंदगी कैसे सिमट जाती है यह अब पता चलता है पहले दरवाजे बंद हुए सो सुदीप्ता यूर टॉकिंग अबाउट दैट होम एनवायरमेंट इट इज हैपन इन अवर होम्स इट इज हैपनिंग अराउंड अवर होम्स एज वेल दैट पहले दरवाजे बंद हुए फिर खिड़किया फिर हमारे कमरे पहले दरवाजे बंद हुए फिर खिड़किया फिर हमारे कमरे और मोहल्ले की हवाओं को भी जैसे बांध लिया हो हमने कि पड़ोस में बने हलवे की महक पड़ोस में बने हलवे की महक अब फेसबुक के स्टेटस से पता चलती है पड़ोस में बने हलवे की महक अब फेसबुक के स्टेटस से पता चलती है मोबाइल स्क्रीन चार्जर जिंदगी बस हम बैठे रहते हैं कि नया अपडेट कब आएगा कि नया अपडेट कब आएगा सो थैंक यू फॉर लिसनिंग टू दिस Yes. Chali. That was fantastic. That was beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining in. Thank you, Professor Sarangi. Have a great day ahead, and thank you, Professor Nial, like always, for making this conversation a real treat for people who could join in today, that too on a Friday evening, and have some fun reading uh, uh, to go beyond. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. From thank you. Thank you.